And with that, guys, I now have no idea what is going to happen on the season finale of Fargo, and I am perfectly okay with that. Hey guys, Kevin here from Fargo, Season 2, Episode 9, The Castle, and holy shit, this episode, I mean, just, I'm still getting over it, guys, really, I mean, this was a huge episode, and especially the ending of this episode, I did not see that coming at all, there's so much to love about this episode, and by far, best episode of the season. Let me just get into that right now. By far, best episode of the season. Now, while last week's episode was really funny, this episode was actually pretty deathly serious. I have to say, there really weren't too many jokes in this episode. There were some funny moments, but definitely was a lot more serious than other episodes have been, and that's great. We finally got the big Sioux Falls massacre in this episode. We got a lot of deaths in this episode. Just this was the episode where shit went down, and I love that, and it really was rewarding. Um, it really shows that the show doesn't hold back, and let's just get into this episode. And uh, something I want to say right off the bat about Fargo that I've loved all season is just how unpredictable it's been. I mean, it's going in so many different directions, and it takes so many risks, and isn't afraid to get weird. Um, you know, a few examples being the beginning of this season. The first thing we saw was a movie of Ronald Reagan. You know, there was that. Then, of course, there's been this whole alien conspiracy, which we get a lot more of in this episode. We'll get into that. And, of course, the beginning of this episode, because we don't open up like usual. I thought it was actually really cool the way they did this. We open up in this, like, bookstore. There's this book called The History of True Crime in the Midwest, and we're basically to assume that we've heard all 14 chapters of the book so far. And uh, that thing that we usually see that's like the events in this book, you know, are, are uh, have all taken place, but the characters, but the character name been changed. That was in the book, and I think it's really cool the way they did that. Um, just really gets us into the episode. Right away, I was hooked here. Uh, but we then flip to chapter 14, which focuses on perhaps the bloodiest chapter in the lawn and violent history of the Midwest region. And we have this narrator talking to us who is no who is um, no other than Morgan Freeman. Um, not Morgan Freeman, Martin Freeman, not Morgan Freeman. Martin Freeman, of course, who played Lester last season. Now, this is not Lester. One, because Lester wasn't British, so you know right away this isn't Lester. Two, I just thought this was a really cool idea. This is how you do a cameo without making it forced. Just having a little narration like this, I thought was really cool. I, I actually really liked it. In fact, I'd like them to do it again. It's pretty cool the way they did this. Um, and basically, he tells us, the narrator tells us that most of the murders in this chapter take place in North and South Dakota, even though he considers it to be a Minnesota crime, maybe that's because it revolves around natives Ed and Peggy, who he says were just 29 on the night their lives changed forever, and I was like, holy shit, something's gonna happen in this episode, I mean, that got me so into it, and I'm like, shit, I have no idea what's gonna happen, and I love that. So we flip back to the convenience store. Now, while last week's episode focused on Ed and Peggy and Dodd for most of it, and a little bit of Mike, and a little bit with Lou and Hank, this one focuses on everybody. We saw the Gearhearts again, we saw Lou and Hank again, we saw Betsy again, and that's great. I love episodes where they focus on everyone. Not that I didn't love last week's episode, I really did, and I love the week before when they focused on the Gearhearts, but now's the time to put it all together, and I love that. So, the action flips back to the convenience store where Ed was seen making calls last week, and the shop owner, Maynard, um, sees Hansy approaching with a gun in his hand, and he goes to call the police because he knows that Hansy is bad news, he knows that he can't trust him, and he knows that Hansy is just gonna do something very, very bad. I love that Maynard doesn't know what Hansy's gonna do, but he's ready with his gun, he's ready to shoot him, and before he even gets to call the police, he gets shot in the head before he can even finish dialing the number, and, uh, Hansy is just such a badass in this episode. Now, Hansy, I was really looking forward to seeing what was gonna happen with Hansy, because as we know, we don't really know what his motive is. I mean, he was the one that asked Peggy for a haircut, and then when, you know, um, you know, and it seemed like he wanted to die, but then when she stabbed him, he stabbed her back. So what exactly is his motive here? What does he really want to do? Um... Basically, hand, basically, Hansy enters the store, grabs some hydrogen peroxide and super glue, and basically heads into the bathroom to tend to the shoulder wound Peggy gave him pre-haircuts. And a lot of the reason we get this narrator is for Hansy, because if you guys haven't noticed, unless Hansy has direct interaction with someone, he doesn't get a lot of um, 
dialogue. He, a lot of his scenes, a lot of the best scenes that he's had have been silent. And if you guys thought Hansy was a badass, I mean, I really did think he was. But a lot of hansy has been, you know, he's just, he's very aware of things. He's gotten and received information very well, put things together, found things before other people have. He's just done that very, very well all season. But this is the episode where Hansy becomes the badass we've been waiting for. I mean, it really feels like we've been building up to this, and I love that. So the narrator goes on to say that not much is known about Hansy, but we do find out two interesting things about him in this episode, which we'll get into. Um, but we do know that he stole the keys to Maynard's Cadillac Eldorado, and we also get a glimpse at the first of this week's alien references, which is a bumper sticker on the wall with a spaceship and the statement, we are not alone. Now, we do eventually get to, I do want to talk about the aliens a bit, because I feel it's a bit metaphorical. I don't think these aliens are literal aliens. I think there's more to it than that. I'm going to talk about it because a lot of people have been trying to talk about it. And I'm going to try to, I think, explain it. Now, I could be very wrong what I'm going to say, but I'm going to try to explain it. And when we get to that point in the episode that I know you guys really want me to talk about, because, of course, that's when a million things happened. But um, when we get to that point, then I will try to explain what I think this really is all about. So... Then we finally get to what I really wanted to see in this episode. Of course, we had that amazing cliffhanger last week, and finally we get to it here. I mean, we are only, we are like nine minutes in the episode, and we had not gotten what I wanted to see yet, and I was completely fine with that, honestly. I was surprised by how much I was loving this episode, and I honestly forgot what happened to Ed and Peggy because I was so into the episode already. So back at the cabin, Ed and Peggy are being questioned by the police, and there's a shit ton of police there, and... Hank is filling in the situation, and then the captain, Jeb Chenny, who, let me just say, is probably the biggest dick there is on that force. I mean, anything that Hank and Lou suggest, he's like, no, I know what I'm doing, I'm the boss here, you're stupid, and uh, it's just, it's, it's crazy, and he says something very interesting here, he says, they don't look like much, and his line where he says that, I think, really sums up Ed and Peggy as a whole, I mean... At the crux of it, Ed and Peggy are just a married couple who have gotten into a very bad situation, and it's basically turned them crazy. Peggy definitely has been crazy for a while, but Ed also has turned into a murderer. He's murdered people. They're definitely, they definitely are much, but I like that line because I think it sums up what this show likes to do. The show likes to take ordinary people and turn them into much more powerful, vindictive, antagonistic figures, and they've done that very well with Ed and Peggy. Now, Ed and Peggy, I don't think are our are the antagonists of the season. I don't think there is an antagonist on this show. I really don't think there is, because I really think they do a good job of making every character humanize and understanding every character's motives, and you pretty much root for every character on this show. It's one of those kind of shows, and I really do love that. Um, well, Dodd pretty much was our big villain, but now that he's gone, I don't really think there is a villain in this show, because you do root for the Gear Hearts, you do root for Ed and Peggy, you root for Lou, you root for Hank. I mean, we love all these characters, so I really don't think that they are our villains, but, they, like I said, they, I'm not justifying what they did, but, of course, they were just a normal couple, if you really think about it. And then when Peggy says, I thought it was awesome, her line, or realized, such a good line. Probably Peggy's best line on this show so far, honestly. I love that line, because it perfectly sums up that you might not think we're a lot, but we can do a lot more than you think we can. So Ed tells them that Peggy knocked Dot out back at the house, and he's trying to prove that they are bad, and the two are hoping to trade him for freedom when Hansy killed the deal and Dodd, and Peggy then interrupts saying that she stabbed Hansy, and Hank has to laugh, um, maybe he saw last week's episode, for whatever reason he's laughing about it, and Ed then says, now I'm, I'm only to assume that Hank and Lou saw what happened through the window, because why else would he laugh about that? So Ed then says that the Gearhearts didn't seem interested in Dodd, so he put the offer out to the Kansas City Mafia, and uh, Lou wants Ed and Peggy taken in protective custody. You know, he knows how dangerous they are. He knows that they can't be trusted. He knows what they're going to do. But, you know, his boss, Chenny, is an idiot and doesn't really know uh, what's going to happen because apparently there's no such thing in the particular part of South Dakota. Um... Uh, basically, Chenny wants Ed to wear a wire. That's all they want. They want him to wear wires, and that's it. So it looks like Ed and Peggy might actually be part of the massacre. Lou, however, is not. He's asked to leave. Hank stays, though, and that were and that very much worried me. Um, having Hank stay there. Now, Lou's asked to leave because they just don't need him, and it's really sad because, you know, Lou knows what he's doing. Lou really is the only guy besides Hank that actually knows what he's doing, and they're asking him to leave, and it's a really sad scene. I really did feel bad for Lou here. Uh, but Hank stays, and I was very concerned because you guys know every single time 
I have been thinking we're building up to Hank's death. We're building up to Hank's death. I think this episode solidified it. I really think it did. We'll, we'll get into that, but I really do think this episode solidified that Hank is not going to make it out of this show. I don't think that's going to happen. So, Chenny says he wants Ed to meet with Mike, but with uh, Mike, but he needs to wear a wire. And Ed says he wants all of the details in writing. And uh, then we get to Mike, which I thought was really cool. Now, I was thinking the um, narrator was just going to be for Hansy, but no, he's he does a good monologue. Um, he has, There's a good narration for Mike as well. Because Mike is making phone calls, and uh, we're assuming that he's talking to Hamish. And this was very interesting, we found out here. He lies to him saying that The Undertaker never showed up, but he's on track to get Dodd. And of course, we know that he killed The Undertaker, so Hamish has to find out eventually. I don't know when Hamish is exactly going to, is exactly going to find out, but he has to find out eventually. I mean, he's not an idiot. He definitely is not an idiot. He knows that, you know, he knows what Mike is capable of, and he has to try to figure out why The Undertaker didn't show up. I mean, why wouldn't he show up? He hired him. Why didn't this happen? Um, you know, Mike's being very vague about the details, you know, he's making it seem true, but he's also being very vague, he's not like, oh, something, he didn't explain what happened, he just said something occurred, and definitely Hamish is gonna have to figure this out at some point. So, he does tell him that he's on track to get Dodd, now this is a lie technically, but Mike doesn't know that Dodd's dead, so that's not his fault. So back to the Solverson house, um, we get this moment that none of us wanted to see, all season long, we knew this was going to happen. And this is probably the most inevitable moment of this season. It still was devastating. Um, we see Betsy. She's in the kitchen. Molly's there as well. She's basically just cooking. Um, and she's on the, you know, she's talking to Noreen and everything. And, uh, you know, Noreen is babysitting Molly while Betsy is trying to cook. And uh, while Noreen is talking to Molly, Molly goes downstairs, and Betsy has collapsed. And it really was devastating, I have to say. I mean, we all knew it was coming. I didn't think Betsy was going to make it out of this season. I, I knew she was going to die. I mean, we knew that Betsy was going to die. Molly talked about it in very big detail, how her mother died. And especially since M Molly was the one to witness her mother die... It is devastating to think about, and no one should ever have to see that. It was so sad, but you know what? Two things. One, that made up for Kristen Milotti's character dying on How I Met Your Mother because we didn't see her die, and in this we did. And I, I think Betsy's dead. I honestly think she's dead. I don't think she's coming back. I don't think we're going to see her in the hospital because we don't hear about her after this. And Hank doesn't... I'm The thing is, though, Lou does not find out that his wife is dead. He's going to find out next week, and it's probably going to be very fucking sad, but... uh. Very sad indeed. I felt very bad for Betsy, obviously. It's the one moment we were all dreading. We knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know when. And I thought they were going to keep her on for at least the season finale, but I don't think so. I think she's dead, and it's really sad, but she died. And uh, she's one of the oh, she's not the only death in this episode. We'll get into that. So as now I love the way this was done. This is not just like seeing this scene. This was intercut with what Lou is doing at the time. Just showing that Lou can't get to Molly, to get, can't get to Betsy, and no one can tell Lou what happened to Betsy. And I thought that was definitely very well done. Uh, just showing that Lou is, com has, is completely thinking about other things besides Betsy and has no idea that his wife just passed out. So, Lou pulls up to the convenience store to call home. Of course, no one is there to answer, and also, we're led to believe, let me just say, that Betsy probably did take the uh, sugar uh, pills and not the real ones. So, of course, no one's there to show up, um, and, but as the phone rings, he notices the bullet hole in the window, and he goes to find Maynard dead. We also get another shot of that bumper sticker, and this is when Lou's realizing, oh shit, Hansy's the one that did this. He's a lot more dangerous, and uh, a cruiser pulls up looking to escort Lou to the state line. Lou tries to tell him about the missing keys, and handsy, but he doesn't seem very interested. He really doesn't. I mean, he doesn't really seem like he cares, and uh, the big, you know, he again, he really seems very naive. Now, I'm not going to say these people are idiots. I'm really not going to say that. I just think they're naive. They don't understand how dangerous things really are, and they don't really want to take any action, maybe because they're kind of scared, honestly. I think they're kind of scared that they know they're not going to, you know, that they know these people could come after them or something bad. I don't really know. But there are all these people that don't want to take action and edit and lose one of the few people that actually does want to do something about it. And I really like seeing that. That's something we've seen all season long, that there are all these people and they just don't want to do anything but Lou does. And I thought that was a very well done scene. 
So Lou radios the car that's carrying Hank, Ben, and Chief Gibson, and he tells the three that Hansie's in a red El Dorado, but Hansie says they're going to the Motor Motel, and he shifted this one out, and Lou says that he has, he's got a bad feeling about this, and... I love the way they set this up. You know, all season long, I've been building up to the Sioux Falls Massacre. Sioux Falls Massacre. Why else did we, why else does season happen? Because this all started with a simple scene with Lewis talking about how bad the Sioux Falls Massacre was. And we finally get it here. And it truly is, I mean, crazy, really. I don't think it was going to be nearly as crazy as it was. Um, we'll get into that. So, the group gets to the motel, we see someone is watching them, and it's Hansy, and the way that Hansy is just able to do this, I don't know how he does this, but he's able to find where every single, where everyone is, just points them out perfectly, it, it's just, it's great, I love it. So, at the Gerard house, we get a bit of a flashback to the moment where Ricky tells Floyd and Bear, and I thought this was a great moment, because it was something we needed to see. I thought it was interesting they did this in a flashback, though. I really liked the way this was done here, uh, because, of course, we knew that that was going to come. Ricky tells Floyd and Bear that Hansy is on the phone, saying that he found Dodd, but, of course, he doesn't tell them that he shot Dodd through the head, but they do tell him, but he does tell them that he's dead, and what I like about it is that Floyd and Bear, you, they don't get time to grieve over Dodd. One, because we're not really supposed to care that Dodd's dead, obviously. It's devastating that he died, but he's still the villain of this show, and we should be happy that he died. Two, this is just so sudden for Floyd and Bear, and there's so much that happens here that there's not too much time to grieve over it, and I thought it was definitely very well handled the way that Floyd just reacted. She has no idea what to do. Handy just hangs up immediately, and that was crazy. So I really love the way that was done. And the narrator then reappears to say that it's unclear when exactly Hansy decided to betray the Gearhearts. And let me explain this. I think that Hansy is betraying the Gearhearts because of that sign. Um, if you remember that thing he saw where there were these, you know, natives being tortured and they were being called names and things like that. And we find out two very interesting things about Hansy in this scene. And I like that we've kind of been very, you know, um, small detailed with Hansy. You know, we haven't really given a lot of detail. They've been very vague with what he's done. And now that we're almost to the end of the season, now they're going to give us more details. So the first thing we found out is that Hansy wasn't just Dodd's right-hand man. He's actually been with the family since he was just eight years old. So he's been pretty tight with them all his life. And we are to assume that they've probably been treating him like shit all his life. And he just hasn't really seen it till now so also when Floyd asked who has Dodd Hansy says that Mike ambushed Ed who then grabbed Dodd and fled the state to the motel so he's basically trying to make them think I had nothing to do with this this was Mike that did it and uh obviously he's not telling the truth this is not what's actually happening and he's clearly setting them up you know that he has some sort of motive it's like why is he doing this what's going on here and I like the narrator's just as confused um what Hansy did and to make this even more seem more true, I love the narrator says to, it is still undecided today. You know, you have all those you have those history books, and there are events in the history that people don't understand. And in this world, Hansy's uh, betrayal of the Gearhearts is one of them, and I, I love that. I think that's great. So Floyd says she'll be in the motel, a motor mot motel, in three hours, and she's willing to face Mike. She thinks that she's going to face Mike, and Hansi tells her to stay put and to send Bear Loma the dozen men, but she's not having any of it. She's ready to take care of business all by herself, or at least be part of the carnage, and we'll get to that later, because Floyd's saying that. You guys will see why. I mean, you guys know why I saw the episode, obviously, but damn, I mean, that's probably the worst thing she could have said. So in one of the hotel rooms, Ed asks Ben if they're doing the right thing with the sting, and Peggy comes out of the washroom to interrupt the conversation and offers them tea, and Peggy's big plan is to sneak out while Ben is sleeping. She's not aware the other room is filled with cops, you know, she's not aware of that, and she thinks that maybe she can talk her way out of it, though. After all, she seemed a little flirty with Ben. I thought it was cool that she's trying to flirt with Ben to get out of this. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but Peggy's obviously, again, very, very smart at what she's doing, and she has a much bigger plan. Now, my only person that feels while she's going to run away with Ed that she might just stray him away, I mean, the way that she was flirting with Ben, I think just kind of shows that she doesn't care if she gets out of this with Ed. She just wants to get out of this in general. She doesn't care if, if uh, Ed is included. She just wants to get out of this on her own in any way she can, and that's how she's going to do this. And then we get to the massacre, which, holy shit, I mean... I knew this was going to be crazy. I did. I knew it was going to be crazy. 
But this was seriously like the Red Wedding. It really was. I mean, remember how devastated we were at the Red, red, at the, um, red Wedding on Game of Thrones? Very much reminded me of the Sioux Falls Massacre. Now, let me just say, not as, this is not as graph, this is probably just as graphic as the Game of Thrones one. It's not as shocking because we knew it was coming, but it was still very, very shocking because we had no idea what was going to happen here, and I love that. I mean, they really were very vague about it, and I love seeing that. Now, we knew that this obviously really affected Ed and Peggy, and what happens, I could not have expected to happen. I mean, it's crazy. So once Lou makes it to the state line, he gets a call on the radio. It turns out that Hansi did kill Constance. He did not spare her, since the call said that she was found strangled in the hotel room. And basically, we're realizing that Hansi's willing to basically take out anyone at this point. So the news sparks a fire in Lou, and he heads back into South Dakota, and he's realizing, oh shit, if Hansi can kill Constance, he can kill the Gearhearts, he could kill anyone, and he's gonna try to stop him. So that night, Lou sees the Gearheart caravan out heading out, knowing exactly where they're going. He tries to radio head to the Motor Motel, but they've gone silent. Now remember, Lou and Floyd had a deal. Hank, Lou, and Floyd had this deal that she won't do anything and that she just wants to keep her family safe, and he's honoring that deal. That's why he's going out there to protect them, because if you remember, they had that deal. So the radio's turned off, but a few cops are still up playing cards while Hank lies awake and Peggy watches the same movie she was watching back at the cabin. What's interesting about this movie is that she, whenever she watches it, she always seems so, like, transfixed in the moment. Like, there's nothing else going on around her. Like, this movie is all she cares about. I just find that very interesting overall. And I don't really know what they're trying to say about that, but I find that overall very, very interesting. So Bear tells Floyd that once they reach the motel, he wants her to stay in the car with Hansi. They drive up to the back of the hotel in complete darkness, and of course, you know, they think that Hansi's going to help them out here, that he, they're gonna, that he's going to get them away from Mike, and it would make sense because they don't know about Hansi's betrayal. They don't know that Hansi killed Dodd. They don't know that Hansi is planning to kill them. You don't, you know, they don't know. So Hansi tells the group that they have two rooms upstairs and three on the bottom, the group stabs an undercover cop that's half sleeping during his outside watch, and after having his conscious eat away at him, Hank wakes up, says, screw this, gets ready to leave. However, the gang is slowly moving around to each door, and uh, Hank does get stabbed here, and I was like, no, don't kill Hank, please, don't kill Hank. I was, like, freaking out. I was honestly, I was like, please, don't kill Hank, don't kill Hank. I mean, you guys know every episode, I am so uneasy about Hank, because it just seems like he's gonna die every episode. So wherever the gang is moving slowly, is slowly moving around to each door, on Bear's signal, they're kicking in doors, they're just, they're just, they just start killing anyone, pretty much, and Hank doesn't go down without a fight, though. Ben either, Ben does kill two of the Gearhart's men, and they get knocked out by Peggy, and when someone yells out their cops, Floyd turns around to look at Hansi, and he looks like he's going to comfort her, like he's going to help her here, um, like he's going to make her feel like, you know, she matters and just help her out. But he stabs her and I literally was like, <gasps> like, I did not expect Floyd to die. I didn't. I thought Floyd, I knew Floyd was probably not going to make it out of this season, but I really did expect her to go down with more of a fight. And why do I think that Floyd died? Because she was the one all season long. She's want to take action. She's told her family, no, no, no. I want to do this. I want to be the one to take action. I want to be the one to do this. And her doing that, her wanting to take action, that was her downfall. And it's really sad because she only really wanted to help her family. That's the only reason Floyd wanted to do this. The only reason is because she wanted to protect her family and wanted to make sure that there were gear hearts alive. She just wanted to do that. She never really wanted to hurt anyone except for the people that endangered her family. I mean, she never went after... Ed and Peggy. I mean, she only went after them when they were going after Dodd. That's the only time. She never went after Lou. She never went after Hank. She only went after those that tried to hurt her family. And that's pretty much why she died. I felt so bad for when Floyd died. Problem is, we don't get time to grieve over her death, though, because there's more going on. And I love that. I mean, I love that we didn't get time to grieve over these deaths because we just need to watch this massacre happen the way it happened. So Bear sees what's going on, runs to his mother. He's obviously freaking out. But Lou shoots him in the neck, and uh, Bear, basically being as strong as a bear, heads towards Lou. Despite being sharp, Lee, Bear actually tackles Lou to the ground. I'm like, no, 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 no. There is no way they are killing Lou in this episode because Lou is supposed to be the main character of this show. Yes, Fargo, to its core, is an ensemble show, but Fargo, you know, but, but Lou is the main character of the show. Without Lou, we would not have this show. Show, of course, because of Lou's story in season one, he's been the main character all season. Um, 
So I'm like, no, 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 no. There's no way they're going to kill off Lou. There's just no way it's going to happen. I honestly thought they were going to do it. I thought they were going to kill off the main character in this episode and pull a Rob Stark. I really thought they were going to do that here. I mean, a Ned Stark. I thought they were really going to do that. So as these two struggle, Hansi goes through, picks off anyone and everyone who's left. Literally just anyone that's there, he's going to kill them. However, according to the narrator, Hansi's actually looking for Ed and Peggy. Maybe he wants revenge, or maybe he just wants that haircut. But the narrator says it could be the two were witness to him killing Dodd, as well as his moment of weakness. Now, this was very interesting. Um, him saying that it's because of his moment of weakness. I kind of do agree with that, honestly, because why else would he want to kill them? They were the ones that saw that he is kind of weak and that he is, you know, very a very emotional person, and he wants them to die for that because he doesn't want people to know that he has a heart. He doesn't want people to know that he has feelings. He doesn't want people to know the pain that he's really suffering through. And it's really sad, but that's just because Handy doesn't want to open up to anyone because he just doesn't trust anyone anymore. After seeing that sign, that's broken him. He doesn't feel the same way he used to. Maybe he cared about things in the past, but he doesn't care now. All he cares about now is just killing anyone that's ever hurt Indians, ever treated them wrong, and that's really what I think this is all about. He does doesn't want to really open up to anyone. That's why it's so sad. What he doesn't realize, though, is that Peggy has a gun which she used to fire right through the door and through Hansy. Then just it looks like a mortally wounded bear is going to kill Lou with his bare hands. We see aliens show up. And uh, Bear is memorized and so is a wounded Hansy, rightfully so. Now, let me just say, I don't think these aliens are actually aliens. I really don't think they are. I think there's a lot more to it than that. I kind of feel like this is trying to be like maybe uh, these are just like Hansy's um, kind of like, you know, back in the day when they had the Alien Sedition Act. I mean, if you guys don't remember it, it was back in like the 1800s. Well, that was back when if you were not a native from the United States, they had this thing called the Alien Sedition Act when you're basically like an alien. Hansy all season long has been like that. And I kind of feel like this whole alien is just trying to show that Hansy is kind of like this alien and he's kind of just different from everyone else. I really feel like that's what they're trying to show here. So, rightfully so, this gives Lou time to grab his gun, blow a hole in the back of Bear's head, and that was just huge when he did that. Now, I know a lot of people are wondering, why the fuck did he kill Bear? Because Bear was the one that was going to kill him. I mean, Bear was just going after him because Bear needed to take out his aggression on someone. Bear did not go after Lou, obviously, because he knew he wasn't responsible for Floyd's death. But he went after him because he just needed to take his anger out on someone. And anyone that he saw, anyone that Bear would have seen, he would have done the same thing to. It really didn't matter who you were, he would have done that to you regardless. So while Hansy stares, Ed and Peggy run out, throw hot water in his face. And they didn't shoot him, I think, because they know that he's powerful. He knows that he prob they he probably shoot them back. So Ed stops to stare at the sky as well when Peggy interrupts to say it's just a flying saucer. I love her line. It's just a flying saucer, hun. We gotta go. I thought that was really funny. And uh, they are on the run, and we're not gonna see them until next week's episode because that's what next week's episode, the finale, revolves around. So Lou stops and looks up. It seems like Brain or something is falling on him and the others. However, the sound of shots being fired snaps him out of him into an area where he isn't such a target. Hansy and Lou exchange a little gunfire just before Hansy disappears, and he definitely is going to go after Ed and Peggy. So at this point, we're thinking it's all over. It's not. Mike and Gail drive up. However, after seeing the aftermath and hearing the sirens, they know they aren't really needed there, and they take off because they know of the craziness that just happened, and... Uh, we're definitely going to see them next week. I mean, this is not the end of Mike and Gail. They're going to get their revenge. They're going to kill someone. You know it's going to happen. Uh, they're definitely going to go after someone. We don't know who, but they're going after someone. Probably Handy. That's probably who they're going after. So then we get the ending of this episode, and Lou hears Hank call out, goes to find him still alive, and luckily Hank is alive, but I don't think he's alive for long. Lou says that Ed and Peggy took off with Handy right behind them, and by the way, Damn, I mean, just that whole massacre. I'm still trying to process it. Let me just say that in this scene, I was like still trying to process it. But it was such a good scene. Lou says that Ed and Peggy uh, took off with Handy right behind them. And Hank promises that he'll live and tells Lou to go after them. And I'm not really sure. I mean, this really seemed like a final confrontation between Lou and Hank. It makes me feel like if Hank does live... Lou's never going to see him again. I really feel it's going to be something like that where he doesn't really see him again, and it really felt like a final confrontation here. So the episode ends with this song, Run Through the Jungle, with another nod to just how crazy things are, and that's basically how this episode ends. So, holy shit, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen in next week's finale, and I'm perfectly 
okay with that. I mean, it's just that crazy of an episode. I can't believe that most of our main characters are dead now. I mean, they are. Floyd's dead. The Gearhearts, that's over. Every and the thing that's interesting now is that... You know, it seemed like all season long, the Gearhearts, they were the main threat of the season. When really, Ed and Peggy are. Ed, Peggy, and Hansy are. This A lot of this second half of this season has been building up to Hansy's sort of demise, but also character development as a badass. And you really did see that here. Very much remind me of Flesh and Bone, which, spoilers, if you guys haven't seen Flesh and Bone, I don't want to spoil that. But if you guys know, in the final episode of that show... Romeo finally emerges as a hero after being called many r rude names and things like that. I think Hansies is being done a lot better, though. I definitely will say that. I love the way they're building up with Hansie, and uh, I kind of feel like Hansie's going to make it out alive. I mean, just the way it's going, I feel like he's going to kill Ed or Peggy. One of them's dying. One of them's not. One of them is dying. I know that's going to happen. I feel like they're not both going to die. I think Ed's going to die and Peggy's not. I still can't believe that Ed's alive. I mean, I thought Ed was going to die in this, and he didn't, so... Ed and Peggy, they're on the run, and it looks like next week we had another narration, not from Martin Freeman, but I thought that was really cool the way they did that. A very subtle cameo. I really love that. I hope they do that again because that was awesome, and I hope that that happens again because that was just great. It was a really fun twist, and it worked very, very well. I really enjoyed seeing that. Is Lou going to find out that Betsy died? I mean, he has to. I know that Betsy's not, she's not going to live. I know she's not going to live because we know what happens to her. Um, you know, we know she's not around in season one, so I'm pretty sure that she's dead, you know, when he next sees her, she's gonna be dead. Is Hank gonna die? I feel like Hank's dying at some point, you know, we don't really know. Um, I, I feel like even though Hank's saying I'm gonna make it, I feel like Hank just wants to tell himself that, and wants Lou to think that, when really he knows he's probably not gonna make it. We'll have to see, uh, what happens there. Now, what do you think the alien symbolize? Like I said, I really think it symbolizes just how different Handsy is from everyone else and how everyone sees him as like kind of like an alien. I think that's kind of what they're trying to symbolize here. Because if you think about it, Handsy has really been the one that's connected to all the aliens. He's noticed them. He's talked about them in detail. I really feel like the aliens are a lot more metaphorical than what... I don't think they're actual aliens. I think there's definitely more to it. Um... So I'll have to see what happens in next week's finale. I have no idea what's going to happen. What's going to happen with Mike and Gail? Obviously, I think they're definitely going after uh, Hansy. We'll have to see what happens with that. Definitely, there's going to be something that happens there. I can't believe that Floyd's dead. I can't believe that Bear's dead. Let me know if you guys saw this episode. I loved every single minute of it. By far, best episode of the season. I have no idea what's going to happen next week's finale, and I love that. And I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for the mid-season finale of The Flash. And I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.